name is Murray Richmond, and I'm the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church here in Medford. And as always, it is our pleasure to be invited into your home to bring you the Word of God. And I just hope that it touches and blesses you. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here, until the Let us join our hearts in the call to worship. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make God's path straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain will be leveled. The crooked will be made straight. The rough, rough and rocky ways will be smoothed. All will see the salvation of God. See the light from on high. The dawn is breaking. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Light of the world, treasure of heaven, brilliant like the stars in the wintry sky. Joy Reach through the darkness, shine across the earth, send the shadows to fly. Light of the world, from the beginning, the tragedies of time were no match for your love. saw my story God you entered in and became one of us Sing hallelujah Sing hallelujah Sing hallelujah for the things he has done Come and adore
He will ransom his all Through clouds he will lead us Straight into glory And there he shall reign Forevermore Oh, forevermore Sing hallelujah Sing hallelujah first lesson is this beautiful lesson of hope from Isaiah chapter 25 verses 6 through 9. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord whom we have waited. of Mark. Hear the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He is not here. Look, there is a place they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you so. So they went out and fled 
from the t- and they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid the word of god for the people of god thanks be to god albert einstein once said that the advent of the atomic bomb didn't change anything it changed everything The same could be said of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It changes everything. It is a game changer. At a historical level, we see a man rising from the dead. That's not been done before. I use the word historical deliberately. There have been alternative explanations for the resurrection. I mean, we do know that the disciples soon after Jesus' crucifixion were going around telling everyone that he had raised from the dead and there's slight evidence that other people had seen jesus and so you know now there's some people that said well jesus really he had just swooned he didn't really die on the cross he was comatose when they took him to the tomb and he was able to wake up then and roll the stone away and and kind of fake his resurrection there's a couple problems with that the first being how is a man who just a couple days before had spikes driven through his wrist and his ankles, how is that man going to roll away a very large stone? Secondly, he hadn't had anything to eat since Thursday night. He must have been famished. Now, of course, Jesus was used to fasting, but not after being crucified. And so how in the world, with the wounds that he had and the lack of nourishment he had, did he come across and able to convince people that he had been risen from the dead, that it was a new life. I think that's kind of impossible. Then some say the disciples stole the body and then made up a story about the resurrection. Well, there are other eyewitnesses other than the disciples, but there's a couple problems with that as well. Chuck Colson, who was one of the people who went to jail for the Watergate conspiracy, said that um, on one day people got together and they decided that this can't get out and they needed to have what later was called a cover-up. Within two days of the cover-up, word was leaking out. Word leaks out. And that's why I have a hard time with most conspiracy theories is people have a hard time keeping secrets. People have a hard time keeping anything a secret. If you look at the news and see how much is leaked out there, it's kind of hard to believe that there's some overarching body that can keep a secret for a long time. And it's hard to believe that with all 12 disciples that none of them would break down and say, he didn't really, he wasn't really resurrected, we just faked it. And considering that all 12 disciples probably died a martyr's death, that makes it more incredible that they would have been faking it. I mean, it can be hard for someone to die for what they know to be true. Who do you know that would die for a lie? just to keep a hoax covered up. Eventually, someone was going to spill the beans, and no one did. No one did. We do know that the word of Jesus' resurrection had gone out, and within, say, 30 years of the crucifixion, all of Asia Minor had some kind of Christian presence in it at some point. Um, Sherlock Holmes said that once you eliminate the impossible, whatever is left, no matter how improbable it is, must be the truth. It's hard to explain the dramatic and southern rise, sudden rise of Christianity without acknowledging the resurrection. Yes, it may be hard to believe, but it turns out to be the best explanation. Now, there are a couple of interesting things in the resurrection story that we heard in Mark. First, in the Bible, when Mark talks about the resurrection, the angel says, he has been risen. It's the passive voice. And that's carried throughout Scripture. Paul talks about the risen Christ, the one who had been risen. The resurrection was something that happened to Jesus, not something he did. God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, this tells us two things about God. First, God is capable of raising a person from the dead. And what that tells us is that God is capable of bringing hope into hopeless situations. 
Have you ever felt like you were just overwhelmed with life and you couldn't handle what was going on? And the, you seemed to be like there was no way out? Look at death. How do you get out of death? And yet, according to the scriptures, we do. We will be resurrected with Jesus. If that is true, how much more can God work in our life today? How much more can God be a part of giving us hope in the midst of hopeless situations? How much more can God show the love that was portrayed in the Feast of Isaiah, where Isaiah talks about overcoming death centuries before Jesus was ever born? The resurrection gives us hope, not only that God can raise us to a new life, but also that God can work with us in the life that we're in now. This life is partly a preparation for immortality. We will all face death, all of us, just as Jesus did, but then God will raise us up to a new life. Think about it. Your time here is but a small fraction of your life. You are being prepared for immortality. Now, I don't talk a whole lot about the afterlife. If you've been following me over the years, you know that most of the sermons I, ha I give have to do with living in the here and now. But I think we need to remember that we are not mortal beings, that we are immortal, and that there is life beyond the life that we have here. I believe fully that we should live the life we have here, but every once in a while we need to look at the resurrection and kind of get a, a spot check on where we are in terms of our ultimate destiny, our ultimate values. If one day we're going to be with God, it makes a lot of sense to, to get to know that God before you're with him. And we have to be careful. For I, I believe that... Um, um, uh, the, 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 when I am dismissive of a person, I should be very careful because I might be spending eternity with them. I, and imagine what I'm going to do when Habakkuk comes up to me, the prophet Habakkuk, whose book is in the Old Testament, comes up to me and says, so, how'd you like my book? And all I can do is like, oh, yeah, it was, it was great. It was great. No, it was, yeah, it, it, it was great. It was really good, really good. The biggest thing is to trust in God. If the author of life can raise Jesus from the dead, what can God do in our lives if we put our total trust in him? What hardship will I face that is greater than death? And in death, in the words of Paul, death hath lost its sting. If that is what God can do with my death, imagine what God can do with my life. Now, the other interesting thing about the way Mark tells the story, and it's very different from the way the other three gospel writers tell their stories. First of all, Mark doesn't have any, uh, any of the disciples going to the tomb. It's just the women. Now, that's kind of amazing because back in that time, women were not considered reliable witnesses. They were not allowed to give testimony in a court of law. They were not considered reliable enough. And yet, when God chooses people to spread the word of the resurrection, he unlikely, most unlikely, chooses the women to do it. That's kind of preposterous. That would be the last, you, you, you would want a, a man who had solid reputation to be spreading the word. Not some women who were deeply grieving and mourning and you know, someone could say, well, it's just the hallucinating because of their grief. And yet, and yet, God entrusts the message to the woman. They go to the tomb, they see the stone rolled back, and they see that the tomb is empty except for a young man who's dressed in a white robe, an angel. The angel says that Jesus is going ahead to them to Galilee and tells the women to spread the word that Jesus is alive. And they went out, and instead of spreading the word of the resurrection, they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's the way Mark says it. But he does it in a very interesting way. 
Literally, the text reads, and nothing to no one they said. They were, were afraid for, and then it stops. The book of Mark ends mid-sentence because you, in Greek, you never end a sentence with the word for or gar in Greek. You just don't do that. Just in the same way you don't end an English sentence with for. I went to the store because for, and not to say what I went to the store for. It doesn't make sense. I think Mark is doing something pretty sophisticated here. Now, Mark structures his gospel very, very deliberately. For instance, Mark will tell, say, three stories in a row about Jesus. And the first two would have the exact same outline. Jesus encounters someone, he heals someone, the Pharisees are angry because it's the Sabbath, he responds to that. One story about that, two stories about that, three stories, except the third time, Jesus says something totally different, totally unexpected. I think that's Mark's way of saying, yes, there is a way about Jesus, but it will often surprise us. And what he says with his incomplete ending to the gospel is the story is not over. Someone must have said something to someone because everyone listening to this broadcast knows that Jesus has been risen from the dead. It's not a secret at all. I mean, that's one of the things that makes Easter sermons so hard to preach. Everybody knows the punchline. They went to the tomb and he wasn't there. He had risen. We all know that. We all know that. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Mark leaves the rest of that sentence into our hands. Are we afraid to share the message of the good news of the love of God in Jesus Christ? I can see how many people would be. Those women were afraid, and they saw it with their own eyes. I could see how we could be afraid. But someone's got to do it. Someone has done it before us. Someone has spread the word. Many people have spread the word. So that Christianity went from a small band of 12 followers and about 120 hanger honors to a worldwide religion. That's, that's the power of the resurrection. And Mark leaves it in our hands. Will we tell the story? Will we let others know? Will we let this good news out? Or will we hold it to ourselves? And imagine if those early women had just held it to themselves, had not gotten over their fear, did not tell anyone. Jesus would have, I'm sure, seen the other apostles, but they, people did talk. There's a story um, about Jesus after he ascends to heaven, after the resurrection, just before Pentecost. The angels gather to hear his stories. And Jesus told them about his birth and the wise men coming, and they kind of chuckled at that because the angels probably had a hand in that. And he talked about growing up and you know what it was like to be a little kid, and the angels were kind of curious because they had never been little kids. And then he told about his preaching and his teaching, and the angels were impressed with his wisdom. And then he talk, told them about healing people, and they were impressed with his compassion. He told about his arrest and his trial, and the angels were holding back tears, and when he talked about his resurrection, the tears just flowed. And when he talked about his crucifixion, the tears just flowed. And then... He talked about the resurrection and the angels all felt a sense of joy. And one of them says to Jesus, so what do you do next? And Jesus says, well, I left the message with my 12 disciples, 11 now, and they're going to spread the word. And the angels all had kind of an uncomfortable look. And finally, one of them says, the 12 disciples you mean those guys that all abandoned you in the end? And one of them denied he knew you? One of them actually betrayed you and turned you over to the authorities? These people that you would tell a parable and they would go, no, I don't get it. Those are the people you left this message with? And Jesus goes, yes. And one of the angels goes, 
Um, Jesus, what's your plan B? And Jesus says, there is no plan B. This is the way it is. And so it happened that today we are here celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.